You know, our scripture this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. And you know, there are times when we sense the evil of this world and we feel extremely vulnerable, like there's nothing that we can do. Sometimes we wonder how we will protect our families and how we will protect ourselves. Many times we look to our parents, we look to our families, we look to our leaders, our friends, for the assurance that we need to be able to get through the day and to get through these times. In times of national crises, for example, such as 9-11 or Pearl Harbor, we wonder and we shake our heads in disbelief. Every presidential debate that we have heard for as long as I can remember, and every 30-second political commercial that I can remember has always been aimed at saying just this, is that I have a plan. Trust my judgment. You can relax. Is there a plan? Can we ultimately, as, as people, be assured or are we to live with anxiety and insecurity for the remainder of our life? My friends, in today's scripture from Ephesians, God sends us a message through the prophet Paul. And that scripture tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of his grace, his grace which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, all things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have, been, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who in the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. You know, I think this is one of the richest and most rewarding passages in much of the scripture that we read today, beginning in verse 3 through 14, is really just one long sentence. It's really not separated. In, in the original version, it was 202 words that ended with one common period. There's no other sentence like this in the New Testament, and nothing even comes close to this. The sentence is so long that there's no English translation that tries to offer simply one sentence. Instead, we have divided it into shorter sentences. It's not easy to read, but it's magnificent. And it's overwhelming in its beauty and its grace. But this scripture gives us the, the promise that there is a plan. The Bible wants us to know that God has a plan for our universe. I count four times where it's said in these few verses, according to the purposes of his will, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose. A plan for the fullness of time, having been predestined, 
according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Everything in our history, my friend, is moving, is moving in accordance to the purpose of him who works all things according to his counsel. Everything in history is moving toward his plan. To know that there is a plan in the midst of a crisis is wonderfully reassuring. The moment that we're in a crisis, we look for a leader who has a plan. In fact, this plan includes God's choice to bless you, to honor us, and to bless us. Look again at verse 3. As we sense one of the purposes of this plan, the Bible tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now move your eyes to the end of verse 6. He has blessed us in the beloved. Now, I think the word blessing in the New Testament is a whole lot different than what in our understanding of the word blessed means today. <coughs> when we use the word blessed today, it basically means to wish somebody something like, bless your heart. I'm so sorry you failed. Bless your heart. When I was a kid, I'm going to tell you a cute little story, that my mother, one time, my neighbor fell and broke her leg. My mother said, bless your heart. And I thought to myself, bless her heart. Bless the idiot for falling. <laughs> so, anyway, we use blessed in a different way than what the Bible teaches us. The Bible pictures the word blessed as nothing less than having the all-powerful hand of heaven that reaches down to us and touches us and holds us up. To be blessed is to have nothing less than God in our corner supporting us and giving us his support. One of the blessings I think that we see from this verse is the beginning of verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. My friends, you'll want to connect this thought to the words at the end of verse 4 running through verse 5. that says he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according <coughs> to the purposes of his will. It's hard for us sometimes to comprehend the love that God has for us. He didn't simply begin loving us at the time that Jesus Christ died. Our Father loved us. He set heart for us even before the foundation of the world was even thought of. He loves us. God has a plan. In fact, I think in this 202 word lengthy word sentence can be viewed this way. It can be viewed as if we're looking over, I think, God's shoulder and we're, we're watching the jewel of God's plan unfolding before us and we're looking at it from different angles for us to capture the sheer beauty and the grace of God, of His love, of His, of His grace, of His wisdom. God has lavished us he has lavished us as his people, as his children, with all of his grace. If you're in Christ, you're bathed in blessing. That's what the Bible tells us. There is a plan. But I think that plan also has to have Jesus Christ in the center of that plan. Over and over again, Paul repeats the phrase, in Christ or in him. God's plan from before the rebellion at the garden was to send Jesus Christ to another garden, a garden called the Garden of Gethsemane, to extinguish the rebellion that began in the Garden of Eden. God intended for his people to have peace. He intended for us to have a place around him. 
In fact, God's plan is, I believe, to choose from all the various tribes and nations of this earth around the world to gather together around the throne in heaven one day. Just imagine. Just imagine how colorful and how much cultural diversity there's going to be. And it's going to be on display forever, for eternity, not just a short period of time. Now, if we want blessings from God, we need to go to the place where those blessings can be found. As a matter of fact, in these verses, in this verse that we read, the phrase occurs 12 times. It says, you were blessed in Christ. You were adopted in Christ. You were faithful in Christ. You're forgiven. You're chosen. You're graced. You're redeemed in Christ. You possess an inheritance in Christ. And you're sealed in Christ. If I were a pinball machine, and this was, y'all were playing pinball with me as you pulled that little plunger back, and I was shot out into all the things that God has blessed me with, I would just be beat around from one little ding-dong thing to another because God gives us so many blessings. It's an inheritance that God gives us. It's a place that we need to go that is clearly marked in Christ. You will not find God's best blessings anywhere other than through Christ. You need only go to the place that is marked in Christ. It is only Christ where you can experience the life-changing, dead-raising power that raised Jesus from the dead. I asked the question this morning, how do I receive every spiritual blessing that God has for me? I wrote this sermon on my computer. And like many of you will do tomorrow as you go back to the office, as I was there on my computer and I was typing my thoughts and I wrote my thoughts out, including the words that I could come up with to encourage all of us and to show all of us both God's love for you and God's love for me. It was there on my computer that I was able to go back and delete the things that I didn't really want to say. Now, I can move things around to make more sense out of how I wanted to say them. Had I written this sermon a long time ago on a typewriter, I would not have had the advantage to be able to do that. But, you know, I'm so grateful for the age of the computer. I don't have to write anything down. I can type it. I can type a whole lot faster than I can write it. And yet, for Apple and Microsoft's technology to bless me, I had to plug that computer in. I had to plug that computer into that wall socket. The computer then was connected, or it was, re it was united with electricity. And none of these things that I described, these capabilities that I, were able, I was able to do, were available to me if my computer wasn't plugged into the wall like your computer, all of us have to be plugged into Christ. Like your toaster, if it's not plugged in, it's not going to toast your bread. We have to be united in Christ. We have to be plugged in, and unless we're connected, unless we're united, then we're going to miss out on God's best blessings for us. Think of it this way. Imagine that you will meet the daughter of a famous Texas old man. And while she is indescribably wealthy, you on the other hand are utterly destitute. But when you marry her because you're legally married, what is hers now becomes yours. That is exactly how it works with Jesus Christ. This is exactly what the Bible tells us. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Christ. Christ is wealthy. 
but not only wealth. He he has a his wealth is not financial like the rich Texas old man. His wealth is much more useful to us than the financial kind. His wealth is moral wealth. He was sin free. And when you're united to Christ's death, you are now free from the condemnation of sin. It's been paid for you. If the full penalty of your sin has been paid from your moral bank accounts. It is assured by the blood of Jesus Christ. All the medals that Jesus has on his chest, all of his awards, all of his honors, they're now pinned on our chest when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, we're united to Him. Yes, there is a plan. And yes, Jesus has to be in the center of that plan. But I also think that, think that every single thing has to fold into that plan. You know, as Americans, we love freedom. And we love having the choice to be individuals. We believe that the future is unfixed and that many times it's an open script. We believe sometimes, many times, that we can do anything we want, whenever we want, however we want. We'll hear this reaffirmed to us in television shows and movies all the time. This sentiment was expressed, I think, most philosophically in a series of movies that all of us are familiar with. And that series of movies, the trilogy of Back to the Future, I think y'all will remember at the end of the third show of that, Marty McFly and Professor Brown, they said at the end of the third movie, they said, your future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one. We want to feel the future is whatever we make it. But at the same time, we want God to override evil choices and put a plan in place in our lives, a good plan, a plan that we can understand. And when crisis comes, we want God's control over that. We want Him to override the pain in our lives. Look at me with some of the verses that we read, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Notice the word unite here. It says to unite again. Reunite means I think that originally the universe was united. But it has disintegrated over time. And only in Christ can we have that reunification that we so desperately need. Originally, the world was developed and built under one ruler, and that ruler was God. And as we've seen through the choice of the very first couple that God made, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, they, the world broke free from his rule by their sin, and the world was cursed. Nothing went as planned because of their rebellion. Yet God's hand was not entirely removed from the situation. God's plan is still in place as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, all things in heaven, and all things on earth. All of this is part of God's plan. The Bible teaches us that God is completely in control of what happens in history. Yet he exercises that control, I think, in such a way that human beings are responsible for their, free, their freely chosen actions, their free will, and the results of those actions. You see, if a man robs a bank, that evil is his full responsibility. It's laid at his feet. In him we have obtained an inheritance, though, having been predestined according to the purpose of God's will, who works all things according to the counsel of His will. My friends, God is bringing everything, 
every single thing to place where finally Jesus Christ is going to be king. He is going to be ruler of all again. And only when Jesus Christ is king will all things that are now falling apart will come together again. He will heal his people. He will heal our land. God has a plan. Everything in that plan is good and it's moving towards something even greater. There is a plan. Jesus Christ is part of that plan. And we have to fold everything into that plan. And when we do, and when we do, we will have the blessing and the assurance that he is going to be ruler again. You know, as Americans, we love freedom. We love freedom. We cherish individual choice. But that choice sometimes can get us in trouble. So what is the point, really, of this passage that we read this morning? I think that this passage really is more of a prayer. It addresses, it's addressed to God himself. Blessed Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus. To the praise of His glorious grace. To the praise of His glory. To the praise of His works. Church is not intended to be a classroom. It's intended to be a worship center. The Bible doesn't share this plan for you just to consider it. The Bible shares this plan for us to rejoice and to cheer. The invasion of D-Day on June the 6th, 1944, was called the most difficult and complicated operation ever. The invasion called for 156,000 troops in Normandy alone. Nearly 2,400 aircraft and over 6,900 naval vessels would be used in that invasion. But by the end of June the 11th, Operation Neptune had grown and had grown and, had, and ensured that more than 326,000 troops and over 54,000 vehicles and over 104,000 tons of supplies had landed on those beaches to repel Germans' Nazi forces. Winston Churchill said this, that this was the most difficult and complicated operation that has ever taken place. God says, you're impressed with this plan. Wait till you see mine. Wait till you see mine plan. Who knew that back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve rebelled, that it would take a garden to fix that rebellion. Who knew that the Garden of Gethsemane was necessary to fix what happened in that original garden? And who could imagine that God in lavish grace would fix his children in a garden again? Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit to each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer would there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb would be in it, and His servants will worship Him. Then they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. The night will be no more, for they will not need a lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be our light and will reign forever and ever. This assurance comes to us from the book of Revelation. The Bible doesn't share God's plan for us to critique it, but to praise it. When you see this plan that's unfolding in front of us every day, we need to bow on our knees in humility. When we see this plan unfold in front of us, 
We need to lift our voice in worship. God is praised by those who He has blessed. Yes, wonder at this plan. But I think we need to marvel more at who made the plan. You were loved. You were loved by God. God has a plan for each one of us, individually and as a whole. That plan is being carried out through God's church. God loves you. God cares for you. God blesses us. He gives us wisdom. He gives us grace. He gives us mercy. And He encourages our humility. Pray with me. Father, we are so grateful for your plan. We shudder, we shudder to our very souls at times when personal crises emerge. Father, our disasters are, are our own doing. Yet you have a plan. We are amazed at your intelligence and your kindness that you have toward us as your children. We're thankful for your love that you have for us. We're grateful that you planted us in a garden and that you are taking us to a garden city. Father, you're keeping your promise that you made to Abraham. You have blessed us by your grace. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you for crushing the head of the serpent when we fail to obey. You paid our debts. And we thank you for showing us mercy on that cross. Father, we long to see your face. We long to enjoy your presence as Adam and Eve did so many years ago. Bless us with your presence and remove us from the sin that so easily hurts. Walk with us again through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray these things in your name this morning. Amen. Are you in God's plan? There was a woman by the name of Sue who was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. But the night before she was to hear the results of her biopsy, she was filled with anguish and she was filled with despair. She knew that something was wrong and she feared the worst news the next day when she visited the doctor's office. But then, as she entered the doctor's office, she felt an overwhelming sense of calm. A sense that overwhelmed her to the point of the reduction of her anxiety and her fear. She heard the words. She said, it will be all right. I am with you. She called it a chilling moment, but she also said it was a gift that would sustain her throughout all of her day. I ask the question this morning of all of us, are we united in Christ? Are we adhering to His plan? Or are we going against His plan? If we are, seek repentance. Seek, seek the guidance of God in your life. <clears throat> and we will have that reunification in that glorious day when all the tribes and nations will gather around the throne and we'll be there for eternity. God loves you. Stand with us as we sing, just as I am. Listen to the words of this beautiful, beautiful song. I think it's 357. Yes. As we sing, listen to these beautiful words, just as I am, without one plea. <coughs> sing with us. Are you united to Jesus Christ? All you have to do is come to Him. Just come to Him. This love you have not known. His love has broken every barrier down. His love is more than divine. His love is beautiful. All you have to do is come to Him. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. In your name we pray.
I hope you have a blessed, glorious, happy week. God be